Hi, I'm Jen. Welcome to Christian Fire Poppy. Um, I'm excited to share what I have to share with you guys. In fact, I have so much to share today that I am really kind of just winging it here. I usually prepare and have a lot more visuals, um, but this time we are going to just dive right in because there have been so many things happening and so many things coming up that I'm kind of overwhelmed with all, all the thoughts and the things that I've learned. I don't have the time or the means to create these perfect presentations to share all of it because there's so much more. Are there too many ideas in my head? So basically what it comes down to, and I've had a lot going on just in my personal life. I just got back from traveling. Um, in my last video, I talked about how I was going on a cruise to Europe during the Revelation 12 sign. That was for me on a personal level, just a huge miracle because I didn't know at the time that I would discover all of this Revelation 12, but this stuff, this was a trip that was set up by my in-laws a year ago. And I had some just special personal experiences related to that that made me really excited for it. Um, I'm going to share a little bit of the things that I've learned. And also we're going to talk about what happened during that time. So the UN had their big meeting. There are interesting things having to do with Israel that happened during that time. And also today, there's a lot going on just today. Today is the eve of General Conference. It's also the eve of the holiday Sukkot. That is the big Jewish holiday having to do with temples. So I wanted to prepare more and get this video out today, but even more so, I want to go to the temple. So I'm still in my clothes, I raced home and I decided, even though I'm not done, I'm just going to share what I have and then move forward because there's a lot coming up as well. So I'm going to finish this video and then just try to keep rolling. But excuse me while I just wing it a little bit more with this one. So let me just start and share some of the presentation that I have put together and some things that I've been learning. So here we go. All right, so one of the things, actually, let me get rid of myself on there. You guys don't need to look at me while I talk to you. <laughs> there we go. That's better. Okay, so on this trip, we had a chance to visit a lot of sites. We went to Italy. This picture on the left here is Capri. It was absolutely beautiful. Um, so there were a lot of beautiful sites. We went to Sorrento, but my most... the the best part about the trip for me was seeing all of the ancient history and looking at it through a scriptural lens. This picture right here, you can see uh, David in the background, Michelangelo's David. And as I saw that, I just thought about all the stories of David. My husband's name is David. And I just thought about, you know, how David was just this amazing character who had a heart for God and all of the wonderful things that he did and thinking about how he took down Goliath and he rose up to be one of the greatest kings of Israel. And um, right on the like on the right here, you can see this is an ancient baptismal font, one of the oldest Christian baptismal fonts. They were very excited to find that. So our family, it was all of our extended family adults that were there on my husband's side. And that is the font right there. And we also had a chance to go to Rome and and look at the the Vatican and we also got to see the Colosseum and that was really sad to think about really there were a lot of Christians that died in that Colosseum and died for their faith um, and when I went to the Vatican there was a lot of art depicting as well the sacrifices and um, I had to think a lot about you know the apostles and their mission as they preached in Rome it's pretty amazing um, and all of this I got to think about all of this while the Revelation 12 sign was in the heavens. And I thought about how God's covenants to us are true. They're good. And God shows us in so many ways, in all things, all things to note, there is a God. And I feel like in our lives, if we look for it, God will just show us every second of every day. He will testify to us that he is with us. He's with us every single second of every single day. And he's wanting to teach us. And I love it. It's amazing. Um, so one of the things that was really on my heart and mind as I traveled was this theme that kept coming up about the kingdom of God. And I was thinking about how God is going to, the kingdoms of the world as we know them now are going to be shaken and changed because the kingdom of God is going to be set up. And so Dr. Covenants 93, 53 
says, And verily I say unto you that it is my will that you should hasten to obtain a knowledge of history and of countries and of kingdoms, the laws of God and man, and all this for the salvation of Zion. Amen. And in Mark 4, 11, it says, And he said unto them, Unto you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God, but unto them that are without, all these things are done in parables. And in 2 Nephi 11, 4, it says, Behold, my soul delighteth in proving unto my people the truth of the coming of Christ, for for this end hath the law of Moses been given. And all things which have been given of God from the beginning of the world unto man are the typifying of him. I think that can kind of explain really my motivation for a lot of these videos and why I get excited because I think everything in the world around us, whether it's an event, whether it's looking at the fall of Rome, the things that are happening in our world, in our lives, in history, in the scriptures, in the heavens, the stars, the sun and the moon, everything is typifying and testifies of Jesus Christ in some way or another. And if you let the spirit in, it'll teach you in some pretty amazing ways. So I'm excited to just share what I've been thinking about and pondering, and maybe it will kind of stimulate your thoughts and get you thinking about things as well. Um, so in Alma chapter 30, verses 43, it says, And now Korahor said unto Alma, If thou wilt show me a sign, that I may be convinced that there is a God, yea, show unto me that he hath power, and then will I be convinced of the truth of thy words. So at this point, Korahor is asking for a sign. And Alma said, You have signs enough. There are signs all around. He says, Thou hast had signs enough. Will you tempt your God? Will ye say, show unto me a sign when ye have the testimony of all these thy brethren and also all the holy prophets? The scriptures are laid before thee, yea, and all things denote there is a God, yea, even the earth and all things that are upon the face of it, yea, and its motion, yea, and also all the planets which move in their regular form do witness that there is a supreme creator. So God gives us signs in the earth, the sun and the moons, the motion of the planets, all these things. If we look at them and we study them, we can find these amazing coincidences that are really God's handwriting. So in 3 Nephi 9, 15, it says, Behold, I am Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Sorry about that. I created the heavens and the earth and all things that in them are. I was with the Father from the beginning. And in Luke 21, 25, And he answered them and said, In the generation in which the times of the Gentiles shall be fulfilled, there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth, distress of nations with perplexity, like the sea and the waves roaring, the earth also shall be troubled and the waters of the great deep. So this is kind of a lead in. We will be talking about the eclipse that is coming up very soon. So we have general conference, we have an eclipse, and we have a lot of other things. All right, so something that was kind of interesting while I was on my vacation is I'm always looking for just little things that catch my attention. And sure enough, there are always interesting coincidences. Um, as I'm just looking, I'm always looking for God's handwriting in the world. And it was kind of funny that um, the day that I went and visited the Vatican um, on Christian Homestead, he was talking about how Temple Square is to become like the Vatican. That was a very interesting video. Um, you should check that out. And also um, the day that we were traveling. So you can see right here the day we traveled from Atlanta to Spain. It was kind of weird because <laughs> on that that next day on Christian Homestead as well, he was talking about, you can see here in this video, the general conference approaches there's, he talked about Atlanta and he actually talked specifically about Spain as well, where I was traveling and how there had been these huge floods, big, unprecedented flooding in both of these areas. And sure enough, it was, we arrived in Atlanta the day after they had had these huge floods. And again, same thing with Spain. They had just had these huge floods, not in the area where we were, everything about our trip, the weather was amazing. It was perfect, but it was really interesting to be there either, you know, right before and after these interesting things were happening there. And of course it was just, what just kind of made me laugh that uh, Christian Homestead was talking about these different places all over the world within 24 hours of when I was there. So that was kind of cool. Um, when we visited Rome, it was really, <laughs> really interesting. And almost you can see in this picture here, that's Mount Vesuvius in the background. And this is Pompeii. And so I was really, I was really thinking a lot about how these kingdom and th these empires were so powerful. They were huge. They had so much wealth and power and now they were just gone and they just, and the rise and fall of kingdoms, none of the kingdoms will last forever until it's the kingdom of Jesus Christ. 
And as um, I was thinking about that, we kind of were making jokes about, you know, Pompeii and Mount Vesuvius exploding and saying, oh, well, that would be really scary if we saw smoke or if there was an earthquake or anything like that. And so um, my family was pretty disturbed after I sent them a message showing them this piece of news that really just a few days after we left and got home, Pompeii was actually our last stop. So it says that room, Rome, so a leading volcanologist has warned that mass evacuations might be needed in a town close to Naples, which sits on a so-called supervolcano that has been hit by hundreds of small earthquakes in recent weeks. A 4.2 magnitude earthquake struck the area early on Wednesday. This is just this last Wednesday, the strongest jolt in 40 years to rattle the volcanic field known as Camp Flagre or Flagrean Fields from the Greek word for burning. So Camp Flagre sits across the Bay of Napoli from Pompeii. So it's very close. It's a sister to Pompeii and where thousands were incinerated by Mount Vesuvius in 79 AD. However, it is much bigger. So it's a much bigger volcano than Vesuvius. And if it ever exploded at full force today, it could kill millions. Now that would be devastating. Um, and I'm always watching for these things just because we know at the second coming, there are going to be all kinds of things. And we're seeing it in the world all around us more and more just events, flooding and earthquakes. And when I was there, I was just thinking about, oh, those, those poor people in Pompeii and it's kind of interesting to see here. You can see this woman where her face kind of has been rubbed off the statue right out of her mouth was where the water came. So you can see this water basin and this was in the center of the city. So the people could walk towards it, a communal area. And you could even see the areas right next where the water comes out of her mouth and where people's hands had rubbed and were in the side of that basin there. So it was just very eerie how that had been so perfectly preserved and you could just sense that just you could see that the city had been alive and thriving and very wealthy and powerful and you could see all of the art that they had there it really was pretty extravagant they had a lot of marble they had um just great things everybody was living their lives and nobody suspected that this volcano would just suddenly erupt and you can see here this was uh cast that had been poured of a horse and they had you know all of the people there you could see casts of the the people and um anyways it was just very interesting but i just wanted to point out how you know you just never know we take life for granted and you think here in america and in the world around us things are good and you just but you just never know so it's always good to be prepared it's always good to be paying attention and to be ready for anything. Um, so all empires and kingdoms will fall to give way to the kingdom of Jesus Christ. So the latter-day burning will try the righteous and burn up the wicked as all trials do. So we don't have any reason to fear. You know, we're talking, I know there can be a lot of fear surrounding the second coming because we do know there are all these disasters and things. And in a lot of ways, we are living through a lot of these things right now. But we know that God is with us and his covenant is that he will protect us and he will help us. And in Genesis 14, 33, it says, And now Melchizedek was a priest of this order. Therefore, he obtained peace in Salem and was called the Prince of Peace. Now, I'll be making connection. We're we will be talking about the eclipse soon. So just take a note that, that I feel like this scripture really came to my mind so many times. Having to do with this trip and the eclipse and all the things that are happening now. Remember that eclipse begins in Salem. And his people wrought righteousness and obtained heaven. And sought for the city of Enoch, which God had before taken, separating it from the earth, having reserved it unto the latter days, or the end of the world, and hath said, and sworn with an oath, that the heavens and the earth should come together, and the sons of God should be tried so as by fire. So here we have, if you watched my last video, we were talking a lot about the rainbow and water and fire or water and light coming together to make the beautiful rainbow that has to do with the covenant of God. So... In the latter days, we have the sons of God that are being tried so as by fire. Remember, this is coming from Melchizedek. We know that as members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, our covenants and the Melchizedek priesthood of the, is of the utmost importance. And President Nelson has talked a lot about looking into what our covenants mean, being aware of that turning to God, seeking him so that we might have priesthood power. And after this Melchizedek, having thus established righteousness, 
was called the king of heaven by his people, or in other words, the king of peace. And he lifted up his voice and he blessed Abram, being the high priest and the keeper of the storehouse of God. So you can see in this picture here that he's blessing Abram, who would become Abraham. And we know that all the blessings and covenants that have flowed since and that we get to enjoy today and that will be absolutely paramount in these latter days. So the ultimate symbol of hope during the latter day trials for me is the rainbow. And there's a lot of scriptural reasons for that. And we started talking about this. This is kind of a part two to this. Um, but God's mercy is amidst the storm. And also the rainbow reminds us of the arrival of Zion and the city of Enoch. So just a little reminder about the rainbow. Now, whenever we're talking about end of days type things, the latter days, and cause righteous judgment. It is not something, again, I don't want anybody to feel fearful as we talk about this because really God's mercy triumphs over all. And really all of his ju judgments and chastening is for our good in the end. And so in Genesis 9:21 it says, And the bow shall be in the cloud, and I will look upon it that I may remember the everlasting covenant which I made unto thy father Enoch, that when men should keep all my commandments, Zion should again come on the earth and the city of Enoch, which I have caught up unto myself. And this is my everlasting covenant, that when they, when thy posterity shall embrace the truth and look upward, then shall Zion look downward, and all the heavens shall shake with gladness, and the earth shall tremble with joy. And the general assembly of the church of the firstborn shall come down out of heaven and possess the earth, and shall have place until the end come. And this is my everlasting covenant, which I made with thy father Enoch. And the bow shall be in the cloud, and I will establish my covenant unto thee, which I have made between me and and thee for every living creature of all flesh that shall be upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, This is the token of the covenant which I have established between me and thee for all the flesh that shall be upon the earth. So we have the rainbow as the token of the covenant, having to do with Enoch coming back to the earth, and the bow shall be in the cloud. So the Lord, this part was really interesting. This really hit me at a special moment as I was on the boat, and I was pondering on just this imagery of the rainbow and the ark and this year as i've talked about before my word for the year is ark so i'm always thinking about just this idea of getting on the ark really binding ourselves with our covenants to jesus christ getting as close to jesus christ as possible and just kind of bracing ourselves for flooding and for god's judgment and they really it's been pretty amazing because there has been a lot of flooding this year so i just am always in awe that um how I God really just made that obvious to me that the word ark would be very pertinent for this year. And it really has and continues to be. Um, right now, I'm going to talk about in just a minute, but some of the biggest flooding is happening in New York today. There's a lot having to do with the scriptures, the book of Enoch, and it all kind of ties into the state, September 29th, 14th history. Well, well, but I'm jumping ahead. So let's go a bit at this scripture and just think for a minute about how rainbow is not only that God won't flood the earth again, but it has to do with God's mercy that his kindness shall not depart from us as his covenant people. So Isaiah 54, six says, for the Lord hath called thee as a woman. So think of the revelation 12 woman forsaken and grieved in spirit and a wife of youth when thou wast refused, saith thy God for a small moment have I forsaken thee, but with great mercies will I gather thee. In the little wrath, I hid my face from thee for a moment, but with everlasting kindness will I have mercy on thee, saith the Lord thy Redeemer. For this is as the waters of Noah unto me. For as I have sworn that the waters of Noah should no more go over the earth, so have I sworn that I would not be wroth with thee, nor rebuke thee. For the mountains shall depart, and the hills be removed, but my kindness shall not depart from thee. Neither shall the covenant of my people be removed, saith the Lord that hath mercy on thee. O thou afflicted, tossed with tempest, and not comforted, behold, I will lay thy stones with fair colors, and lay thy foundations with sapphires. So God's not saying that we won't have troubles. He's not saying that we won't have really big storms. But we will have kindness, and we will have mercy as we turn to him. So the Melchizedek order of the priesthood. So Jesus Christ will reign as king of kings. And global peace comes with this kingdom. So that's part of the excitement of looking at all the things and thinking about the topic of the second coming is that God's kingdom is coming to the earth. And I feel like God is showing this in so many different ways. So in Genesis 14, 33, it says, and now Melchizedek was a priest of this order. Therefore, he obtained peace in Salem and was called the Prince of Peace. 
And remember the very first of the three great American eclipses that are happening over the United States, the first one went over the seven Salem. So all these seven Salem's, Oregon, Idaho, Wyoming, and, and so on. You can take a look at all of the Salem's. That's kind of interesting if you think about how this is the order of Melchizedek and the covenant and the coming of the city of Enoch and the millennium. So I kind of like that tie into that scripture and that imagery. So this is something that's really interesting. Um, I was telling you about all these weird coincidences about how all the areas that I was flying at were being hit by flooding before and after I didn't see any of it, but um, our last flight was actually canceled. And when my husband was telling all of us that our flight from Spain to Amsterdam had been canceled, he just made a joke and said, well, we didn't want to get on that flight anyways, because it was flight 666. And we all kind of laughed. Um, but it was kind of interesting because after he said that it got me thinking on that and I was, I was like flipping through just YouTube and reading things, I actually ran across this information and I might, I might have just blown it off that, oh, that's, that's not really anything, but because that was on my mind, that little joke, um, I think it just caught my attention more and I realized that, wow, that actually is really kind of interesting, just something to take note of that between the American solar eclipses, there are six years, six months, six weeks, and six days. So between the two American solar eclipses. And as we talked about with the Revelation 12 sign, um, I really haven't thought much about Strong's Concordance and how that ties into things. I probably would have completely blown that off had I not seen so many really interesting connections that made sense with the scriptures. Um, and so it is, I thought it was kind of interesting that, um, that this idea of six years, six months, six weeks, six days is actually, if you look on Strong's Concordance, let me go to, oh, it means righteous judgment. So that's really interesting. You see righteous, righteous justice, judgment. And if you look at just the full explanation. It talks a lot about God's righteous judgment. Um, but let me go back. I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit here. So I noticed this piece of information, but then soon after, and you can see right here that I, I double checked that. So I saw that online and I did double check that. Yes, it is six years, six months, six weeks, and six days. Um, but okay. So the crazy thing is, is that I actually was not aware of another set of eclipses that is happening. So there are six years, six months, six weeks, and six days between the two Israel solar eclipses also. So I was not aware of this, but this is really amazing. If you think about the scriptures, how it talks about the two covenant lands, the new Jerusalem, the old Jerusalem, the first shall be last, the last shall be first, and you have an X marks a spot over America, and then an X marks a spot over Israel. So, wow, that's, that's something you have the eclipse on August 2nd, 2027, passes over that area. And then on March 20th, 2034, it creates this X marks a spot in Israel. And how odd that there's six years, six months, six weeks, and six days between those two eclipses and between the first and the last eclipses over the United States. So, um, oh, and you can see also, you know, we've talked a little bit about this as well, but you have the Tav. The Tav is like an X or a cross. So that is indicating Jesus Christ, an ancient sign for Jesus Christ. So God uses signs and symbols to speak. He does this in a lot of different ways. I think God has a lot of ways of talking to us, though, no matter what, you're looking at or thinking about he'll get through to you in one way or another so the aleph is like the a of the alphabet so the aleph is an old now it's paleo hebrew for god's signature the aleph is the first letter of the alphabet and the aleph has a numerical value of one and it represents the one of the oneness of god so you have this aleph here or it also looks like a compass and that is like the letter a of the alphabet and that is right over the united states and then you have the Tav. So the Tav is like the Z of the alphabet. And that you can see right here looks kind of like a cross, kind of like an X. 
And in Ezekiel 9.4, the word often translated mark is tav in the original Hebrew language. The word tav is also the name of the final letter of the Hebrew alphabet, which at the time was made in the shape of a cross or sometimes tilted over like an X. So this is actually different. If you look this up, it's different than the way the tavs are made today. So in certain Essene biblical scrolls, a tav mark appears in the margin beside verses that apply to the Messiah. The purpose seems to have been to indicate which verses concern the Messiah, just as some modern translations have stars or other symbols or colored marks besides messianic verses. So I too am not convinced by the usual scholarly interpretation of the cross marks found on ossuaries on the Mountain of Olives. Some are quite large, much larger than would be necessary for a Mason's mark. I believe that most of these are either Jewish Christian symbols indicating messianic beliefs or perhaps Jewish symbols pointing to the end times just like the crosses on the Essene scrolls. Isn't that interesting? Jewish symbols pointing to the end times. Hmm. We have that marked across the United States and across Israel. So the use of the Tav symbol by the Essenes to refer to the Messiah means that this symbol was being used within Jewish society at the time of Jesus with a meaning very close to that which is later had in Christianity. That the symbol was picked up early by Christians is indicated by the great diversity of cross-shaped symbols in Jewish Christian contexts that have been found in the archaeological excavations at Nazareth, Capernaum, and elsewhere. So this is something interesting. I was thinking about this. I was thinking about the upcoming eclipses. And then I was absolutely delighted when I was touring around the Vatican and our guide was very knowledgeable. And we talked all about, you know, the ancient Christians and the apostles. And he pulled out, you know, a necklace and showed me that this necklace he had. And it was the Aleph and the Tav and Alpha and Omega. And I just thought that was really amazing that he had a necklace like that when I was pondering on this specific subject. That was really cool. Um, something to think about, and you know, maybe this has meaning, maybe it doesn't. I tend to see meaning in a lot of things and I don't take it for, oh, this definitely means this. I don't, I always keep the basics, the doctrine and what the prophet and apostle say, that is the core. So a lot of what we're talking about is just, you know, it's, we're speculating on things and saying maybe, so we're not, putting the cart before the horse. We're just speculating about, you know, maybe some of these other things we're seeing in the world do have meaning. Maybe it's not just random coincidences. So one thought is that if you look at that number of days and months and weeks and years, so you, the number six, 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 six plus six is 12. And the 12 tribes of Israel are being gathered right now. And this is happening in the new and the old Jerusalem. So I kind of like that as an as just symbolism, six plus six plus six plus six and thinking the gathering of Israel. And we have those two different locations that the center places for that. How cool is that? So in first Nephi 13, 42, it says, and the time cometh that he shall manifest himself unto all nations, both unto the Jews and also unto the Gentiles. And after he has manifested himself unto the Jews and also unto the Gentiles, then he shall manifest himself unto the Gentiles and also unto the Jews. And the last shall be first and the first shall be last. And again, you see here this idea of righteousness, righteous justice and judgment. Now we definitely have to talk about the United Nations because in our Revelation 12 sign 2023, remember that we talked about on September 18th and 19th were those big UN meetings and how odd we not only had the child linked to the word feast being born, but we also had an asteroid called United Nations. So it was right there next to the child. So I think we should take a look at what was happening at the United Nations, specifically regarding Israel. Let's take a look at that. Well, if you look at the media and you look at, you can see Netanyahu talked a lot about this, the new Middle East. So at the UN meeting, it produced this idea of a new Middle East and this idea that the purpose of it is for more peace and safety. So you can see the picture of this area right here. They're talking about peace and safety. And then you think about that eclipse that is happening right over that same exact area. So August 2nd 2027 and the next eclipse is march 20th 2034 and this just makes me think of this scripture right here because it says for yourselves know perfectly that the day of the lord so cometh as a thief in the night 
For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as a travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. So we have the Revelation 12 sign in the heavens at the same time that they're talking about a new Middle East that will create peace and safety. Um, very interesting. So this is what we know about this meeting. It says, Israel is at the cusp of establishing formal diplomatic ties with Saudi Arabia by finalizing a U.S. brokered breakthrough peace agreement. Prime Minister Benjamin Tanihu told the U.N. General Assembly in New York on Friday. So this is happening in New York on Friday. So peace between Israel and Saudi Arabia will truly create a new Middle East, he said. Currently, the two countries have no official bilateral relations, but the two countries have been working together covertly on security issues for some time. Anyways, I will let you read the rest of this, and you can also look up more details about this agreement and this new Middle East. I find that pretty fascinating. So some scholars have shown evidence that the preaching of Jonah in Nineveh was successful due to a solar eclipse taking place at the time of his cry to repent. So I told you we were going to talk about the upcoming eclipse. And it's interesting, again, how I think it kind of ties into all of this as far as possible messages. It says, Matthew 16, 2, and he answered and said unto them, when it is evening, ye say the weather is fair, for the sky is red. And in the morning, ye say the weather is foul today, for the sky is red and lowering. O ye hypocrites, ye can discern the face of the sky, but ye cannot tell the signs of the times. So it's kind of interesting here because right before this, Jesus had just done the miracle of the loaves and the fishes. And I think the hypocrites were coming right after that. The Pharisees were saying, show us a sign, show us a sign. They probably wanted him to produce more food and more of whatever it is that they thought he could to satisfy their lust. And, um, but the wicked cannot discern. Here he says that they cannot discern the signs of the times. The signs of the times are there in the face of the sky for the whole world. But instead, they demand an immediate sign from Jesus after he had just done the miracle of the loaves of bread and fish is an amazing sign. Um, so they do not take the time to study or discern the signs all around them or to appreciate the signs and the miracles that are happening right in front of their faces. Instead, they demand that God to you know prove it to them with some obvious sign on the spot at their behest. So they're demanding it in their time and their way rather than looking at what God's doing in his time and in his own way. A wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given unto it, but the sign of the prophet Jonas. So we shouldn't be seeking after these things. We shouldn't say, well, I won't believe till I see a sign. Um, it's more about looking at all the signs and all the miracles and all the beauty and everything that God has given us in this beautiful world and being appreciative of it and looking for the beauty and looking for God's signature and being appreciative of that. Um but I do find it interesting that scholars have connected the preaching of the prophet Jonah or Jonas, which is referring to the same man. Um, and, you know, a lot of things, um, you know, Christian Helms that actually just did a good video about this and mentioned how that on Jimmy Kimmel, there was a guy who not that long ago had actually been swallowed by a whale. <laughs> it was a real life Jonah experience. Um, but I looked up, I kind of remember exactly what the, connection was to the solar eclipse and Jonah. So I looked it up and this is what I found. So let me read this to you. It says, perhaps the strangest part of the story of Jonah is that the king of Assyria believed the words of a foreign prophet who proclaimed that in 40 days, Nineveh shall be overthrown. That's in Jonah three, verse four, the entire city fasted, dressed in sackcloth and ashes and truly repented. What did that ever happen in Israel? The standard procedure of the Jews was to basically stone any prophet who dared to suggest they were not righteous. There must be more to the story, which is not included. Forty years ago, it was pointed out that there was a total solar eclipse over Nineveh near midday on Monday, June 7th, 763 BC, the Gregorian calendar, which corresponds to the approximate time that Jonah preached repentance there. Here's a summary from a recent article. Taking Jonah to be historical as I do, the Bible's one specific clue as to when he lived was during the reign of Jeroboam II, or around 786 to 746 BCE, if we take 2 Kings 14 verse 25 as evidence of the latest that he could have prophesied. 
A total solar eclipse over Nineveh in northern Iraq on June 15, 763 BCE, fits this time frame for the life and career of Jonah. Asteriologist Donald Wiseman, a former curator at the British Museum and editor of Chronicles of Chaldean Kings and Alka Tablets, published a lecture in the Tyndale Bulletin in 1979, where he argued persuasively that this eclipse would help explain the dramatic reaction to Jonah's preaching. According to the Assyrian writing cited by Wiseman, here's what, a scholar, here's what a solar eclipse would have meant to them. The king will be deposed and killed, and a worthless fellow will seize the throne. Rain from heaven will flood the land. The city walls will be destroyed. The Assyrians tell us that at such a time there would be solemn fasting, and the king would hand over his throne to a substitute until the danger passed. At least once, when there was a total solar eclipse, the Assyrians cry, Nineveh shall be overthrown. So in Assyria, in Ararabat Umeyal Nunakai in Abak, which can also mean Nineveh shall be made to repent. So that's actually very interesting if you think about that to them, this is what this scholar asserts that eclipse meant that it was a bad omen, bad things were coming, and that the king would be deposed and killed, and a substitute would take his place. And when I read that, I thought, well, that's kind of an interesting to think. I'm not sure exactly why they would think that, um, but they had some reason to think that it had something to do with the king, the leader of their country. And for me, that actually kind of reminded me of the Ezra's Eagle prophecy. I'm not going to go into that because I can't talk about everything in this one video, but that was an interesting tie. And I would like to kind of dive into Ezra's Eagle in a video in the future, but um, so continue on with this. It says, I believe that Jonah was in Nineveh in June of 763 BCE during the total eclipse of the sun, which would help explain the remarkable response of the people of Nineveh. Jonah preaches at exactly the right time for the people of Nineveh to listen to him. The Assyrian nation was weak and in chaos in the decade around 760 BCE. They had one earthquake, so one sign of divine wrath. There was a famine from 765 to 758. Assyria was losing battles and losing territory to its enemies. There were domestic riots. With all the trouble they already had going on, they could have easily believed that Jonah's warning would come to pass. Now was a perfect time for a prophet from far away to arrive on the scene and command a response. Another link of Jonah to Jesus is that the 40-day prophecy of Jonah and the 40-day fast of Jesus after his baptism in AD 29 both began on the major holy day one prime on the Venus calendar. So it's kind of interesting. So that is a very important and rare alignment because that day only occurs once every 585 days. That may be the link to show in a future article that some important event of the fall of Jerusalem 40 years later occurred on one prime in AD 69, just as we will now see that the fall of Israel occurred exactly 40 years after Jonah's eclipse. So after I read this, I was thinking about how, I mean, I, that that was an interesting thought and I thought, well, if, if one prime is somehow linked to that, and I was thinking about this idea of the king and just kind of applying it to our days, thinking if there were anything that were to happen during the next election and as a Zico prophecy, um, one of the, <coughs> excuse me conclusions that people take away from the Ezra's Eagle prophecy is that President Biden, if it's fulfilled in the way that it seems to be, if you interpret it very directly, it points to the idea of President Biden having a shorter term than President Trump. So whether that's President Biden not finishing his complete term. So I think a lot of people who are looking to see if the Ezra's Eagle prophecy will be fulfilled in that direct way of interpreting it, that President Biden will not be in office until the end of his term. Um, so I know that's what a lot of people are watching for. It will, it, we won't have to wait very long to see if that does happen. Um, but I was curious when I read about this one prime on the Venus calendar, and I do not know much about the Venus calendar, all the things about the Sager calendar, but I thought, well, I'll just go and I'll look up um, if one prime on the Venus calendar has anything to do with our upcoming election in 2024. And oh man, you guys, 
I was pretty surprised um, that it actually did. So I looked up when on what day one prime is. So one prime is Sunday, December 15th, 2024. And 40 days, um, 40 days from that is election day. So if you think about one prime and the 40 day pattern having to do with something with the leader of the country, um, wow, the need for a nation to repent. There you go. 40 days and election day on November 5th, 2024. So yeah, there you go. That was, does it, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> you just can't make this stuff up. And the, the weird thing is I don't ever look up things on the sacred calendars unless I feel like, well, like this. I feel like every time I think to do it, it is confirmed when I really am not expecting it to. So I was not expecting this and I don't know what it means, but um, I just thought I'd throw it on here because I was surprised that there was a connection between one prime, 40 days and the upcoming election. So I guess we'll see what happens. So in Doctrine and Covenants 65.2, overall on my vacation, I feel like God just has so many ways of speaking to us and whether it's in our personal lives or to us as a nation, to us as members of the church, to us as human beings, he speaks in so many different ways. And um, one thing I know to be true is that Jesus Christ is going to reign as King of Kings and it might not be that far away. In Doctor and Covenant 65, 2, it says, The keys of the kingdom of God are committed unto man on the earth, and from thence shall the gospel roll forth unto the ends of the earth, as the stone which is cut out of the mountain without hands shall roll forth until it has filled the whole earth. 38, 9, Wherefore, gird up your loins and be prepared. So let's be prepared, guys, spiritually, temporally, all the ways. Behold, the kingdom is yours, and the enemy shall not overcome. Doctor and Covenant 65, 5, Call upon the Lord that his kingdom may go forth upon the earth, that the inhabitants thereof may receive it and be prepared for the days to come, in the which the Son of Man shall come down in heaven, clothed in the brightness of his glory, to meet the kingdom of God, which is set up on the earth. So let's share those Book of Mormons. Let's share the gospel. Now is the time. It's time to turn to God and to grow close to Jesus Christ more so than we ever have been. Um, I love this picture of our prophet, President Nelson. There's the keys of the kingdom right there. And our prophet is has the authority of the priesthood of Jesus Christ on the earth today. <laughs> but soon enough, Jesus Christ will come himself and reign in the kingdom himself. I look forward to that day. Um, one of my greatest sadnesses on my trip was that the, t the Rome temple was closed. I was so bummed I didn't get to go the Rome temple I would have absolutely loved that um I'm also disappointed to hear that we will not be seeing President Nelson or Elder Holland at general conference that's so sad it sounds like we will get a message though that's recorded from President Nelson and I wish him the best and I am really glad that we I don't know did what we could to send that message message to President Nelson and I know that that message was passed on um I have a friend and connection that was able to pass on that message and thank you to all those who participated he just he's 99 he's getting older we don't know how much longer he'll be with us excuse me i did also pick up a cold on my trip so i tend to get sick whenever i fly on airplanes so september 9th 2023 that's today <laughs> guys there is a lot happening but september 29th today so Something that is really interesting is that it is the 100th anniversary of Israel and not the birth of the nation, but one of the biggest things, the kind of setting up of the foundation of creating the state of Israel. And I'll come back to that. Today is also Michael Miss. It's the Christian holiday where we think about the angel Michael. If you haven't heard of that, it's just look it up. Michael Miss. Um, it is also the Eve of Sukkot, which is a wonderful Jewish holiday. I encourage you to look that up if you don't not know what that is. But it's one of the happiest celebrations and it's tied into the temple. So I always make a point to go to the temple during the week of Sukkot. It is also a time if you read in the scriptures, it's about praising God, having feasts, celebrating with friends and family, being grateful for all that God has done because as we travel 
in our life in the wilderness. We have hard times, but we're saved because we know that God is with us and he's always helping us. And one of the things that the children of Israel used to do to celebrate Sukkot was to give sacrifices to God. And it, um, in the scriptures, it talks about sacrifices of fire. And I think that I like to use the week to just ponder on what is something that the spirit is prompting me to do. Um, this is the time where they would give their greatest, their biggest sacrifices, their gifts. And so this week, I'm trying to think of every day, something that the spirit tells me to do to help someone else to serve, to do family history, to go to the temple, to do something that the spirit pushes you to do outside of just what you would normally do. So I encourage you guys to do that with me. And I know that it will bear fruits, all the many fruits. And Sukkot is kind of about this idea of all the people of the world coming together. And it's the imagery of all the different kinds of fruits all around the world being gathered together. So it's very happy, very joyous. Um, <clears throat> so something to think about today. So today is... Trying here. Is 14 Tishri. And the book of Enoch, chapter 60, depending on which book, it's either chapter 58 and in other translations, it's chapter 60. But this one I use, it says, in the 50th year, in the seventh month, on the 14th day of the month of the life of Enoch. So that's today, the 14th day of the seventh month, Tishri. And in that parable, I saw how the heaven of heavens was shaken violently and the host of the most high and the angels a thousand thousands and ten thousand times ten thousand were extremely disturbed. And then I saw the head of day sitting on the throne of his glory, and the angels and righteous were sitting around him. <clears throat> and a great trembling seized me, and fear took hold of me, and my loins collapsed and gave way, and my whole being melted, and I fell upon my face. And the holy Michael sent another holy angel, one of the holy angels, and he raised me. And when he raised me, my spirit returned, for I had been unable to endure the sight of that host and the disturbance, and the shaking of heaven. And the holy Michael said to me, What sight has disturbed you like this? Until today has the day of his mercy lasted. He has been merciful and long-suffering towards those who dwell upon the dry ground. So again, note this theme of Michael, this theme of rains. He's talking about the dry ground. <coughs> um, so today, <coughs> I didn't finish. We were talking about the eve of Sukkot. It's also the eve of General Conference. And also the Enoch Michael event anniversary and the record breaking flooding in New York City, which is happening today. Um, anyways, and that this Enoch Michael event, this is what we're reading right now. So until today has the day of his mercy. He has been merciful and long suffering towards those who dwell upon the dry ground. And when the day and the power and the punishment and the judgment come, which the Lord of spirits hath prepared for those who worship not the righteous law and for those who deny the righteous judgment and for those who take his name in vain, that day is prepared for the elect a covenant, but for sinners and inquisition. So we're talking about God's righteous judgment. <laughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> this is all about the latter days. He's talking. Enoch is all about God's words for us today. So September 29th, 2023. So today is the 100th anniversary of when the ground was laid for the creation of a Jewish state. So there was a mandate that caused it to, to exist. And that document, the British Mandate for Palestine. <clears throat> Sorry, this is why it's taking me a while to get this video out. I'm still recovering. I also had a passing away in our family. We just had a lot of things going on, but I've been excited to get some of these <clears throat> things out to you guys. So, um, 1920, and it came into effect on this day in 1923, September 29th. Issued by the League of Nations, the mandate formalized British rule over parts of the Levant. Oh. I'm going to let you guys read the rest of that or look it up, but... It's just an interesting thought that that happened 100 years ago. And we think about how Abraham was given the promise when he was 99 that a son would be born to him. And a son was born when he was 100 years old. So 100 years ago. And now we have the birth of a Jewish state, fully mature. Also today, 
it's interesting that that scripture is talking about <clears throat> flooding and things. I'll show you on my next slide. But today, if you look up what's happening in New York, there are life-threatening flash flooding. New York City is being pummeled. And <clears throat> because of my first two flights and how they had just had flooding, and then when my flight was canceled and we ended up getting routed to New York. So instead of going to Amsterdam, we flew into New York. And then from there, we flew back home. But <clears throat> I actually did kind of have that thought that, oh my gosh, I won't even be surprised if New York City has flooding after we leave. And here you go. Um, <laughs> one reason I, I think that, I know that sounds so weird, but when we were in Nauvoo, they had the Dorego, and that was <clears throat> my previous day. I talked about how the day after we left that happened. So I just feel like, I don't know what it is. There's just so much flooding and so many things happening that no matter where I travel, there's something going on. <clears throat> Excuse me. So Enoch, chapter 60, it talks a lot about Michael, righteous judgment, and the rain. And this is on the same day given at the start of the chapter. So 14 to 3. September 29th, 2023, today. So when you see these scriptures like Romans and 1 John and Amos, this is just <clears throat> a version of the book of Enoch where they tie in. They Something is related to another scripture. They list that scripture there. Um, so the, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress truth and unrighteousness <clears throat> for those who deny the righteous judgment. Do horses, so it says, and for those who deny the righteous judgment, do horses run on rocks? Does one plow there with oxen? Yet you have turned justice into gall and the fruit of righteousness into wormwood. <clears throat> I thought that was interesting. That reminds me of in Solarium, I was showing you guys how um, Danishi Mora came and it collided with the 811 <clears throat> uh, asteroid that was called Gaul, the Wormwood one. And the fact that it was discovered on 811 and the scripture about Wormwood is 811. So <clears throat> this is a very Book of Enoch, Latter Days thought, which is um, if you wanted to think, wonder if you're wondering what Enoch thought about the last days and God's judgments and call, here you have it. You have turned justice into Gaul and the fruit of righteousness into Wormwood. Therefore, the law is powerless and justice never goes forth. For the wicked, wicked surround the righteous, therefore perverse judgment proceeds. And when the spirit of the rain moves from its storehouse, the angels come and open the storehouse and bring it out. And when it is scattered over all the dry ground, it joins with all the water that is on the dry ground. And whenever it joins with the water that is on the dry ground, for the waters are for those who dwell on the dry ground for their nourishment. And all these things I saw toward the garden of righteousness. And the angel of peace who was with me said to me, These two monsters prepared in accordance with the greatness of the Lord will feed them that punishment of the Lord. And children will be killed with their mothers and their sons and with their fathers. And oh, that's a random place to end. But it just goes on to talk about the judgment of the Lord. And he's talking about the latter days. <coughs> Excuse me. Well. I need to end this soon before I can't talk anymore, but I do want to end with some scriptures about his kingdom because the kingdom of Jesus Christ is coming. And in 2 Nephi 9, 18, it says, But behold, the righteous, the saints of the Holy One of Israel, they who have believed in the Holy One, they who have endured the crosses of the world and despised the shame of it, they shall inherit the kingdom of God, which was prepared for them from the foundation of the world, and their joy shall be full forever. <laughs> Alma 9, he talks about repenting, and in Luke 8, it says that they came to pass afterward that he went throughout every city and village, preaching the glad tidings of the kingdom of God. And in Romans 14, 17, for the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. <laughs> I'll skip to the last one. Wherefore, may God raise you from death by the power of the resurrection, and also from everlasting death by the power of the atonement, that you may be received into the eternal kingdom of God, that you may praise him through grace divine. Amen.
All right, well, to end because apparently after talking for too long, it gets my cough going back again. And yeah, I've just been recovering from a cold. Uh, we also, on September 23rd, we had a passing in our family. Um, it's my uncle that passed away. And so we've been dealing with that. And <clears throat> it's just been so many things happening. But I do want to share a little bit with you guys. And like I said, there's so much more in my mind. And just a lot of really interesting things happening in the world. And connections to the scriptures, looking at it through the lens of God and faith. And I look forward to uh, sharing more with you in the future. Hope you guys have a really great general conference weekend. And I knew I had to get this out because no doubt there are going to be so many things to talk about after we listen to the words of the prophet and apostles. I look forward to hearing your guys' thoughts. Thanks.